Hi, today we're going to be discussing categorical syllogisms, rules, and the fallacies. Now the rules are very helpful with categorical syllogisms because it gives us another way to determine if they are valid or invalid. Now as a part of that process, these rules either apply to the quality, quantity, or to distribution. And just in case, if you don't remember, I'm giving you a little refresher, quality can either be affirmative or negative. Affirmative statements would be the all are or the some are. The negative statements would be the no or the are not statements. Now with quantity, quantity is either universal or particular. Universal would be the all and the no statements and particular would be the some statements. Now with distribution, distribution applies to every member of the whole class. So if we say the subject is distributed, we're talking about that term, it's applying to every member of that class. So with the A statements, it's the subject. With the E, it's the subject and the predicate. With the I, it's none. And with the O, the predicate is the term that's distributed. So let's move on to the first rule. Okay. And the first rule is, is the middle term must be distributed at least once. If the term is not distributed at least once, the fallacy committed is the undistributed middle. Okay. So I'll give you an example here. We have all sharks are fish, all salmon are fish, all salmon are sharks. Okay, so both of these are A statements because they're all statements, the, the premises. Well, we already learned that with A statements, the subject should be the term distributed. And if you look, the middle term right here is fish. And in both instances, it's in the predicate position. But with the all, um, that's an A statement, so it should be the subject in turn. So in this sentence, the sharks is the term distributed. In this statement, it's salmon that's the term distributed. So this categorical syllogism commits the fallacy of the undistributed middle. Now, here we go for rule number two. Get that where you can see it a little easier. Rule two. And I just put a note here as well. Orange, um, that's the term that is supposed to be distributed. So that's why I'm marking those to make it a little more helpful and easier for you to see. So the rule two, if a term is distributed in the conclusion, it must be distributed in the premise. And the fallacy can either be an illicit major or an illicit minor. So let's take the first example. If we look at the conclusion, it says some dogs are not animals. Well, this is an O statement. And in O statements, the predicate is the term distributed. So that would be the word animals. So what you do is you go up and you look at the premises and find where the word animals is located. Okay, and so it's located here in this first sentence. So now we look at it and do we, we got to determine if this word is distributed. Well, we look and this is an A statement. And with A statements, the subject is the term that's distributed. So in this sentence, horses is the term distributed. But if you go to the conclusion, it's animals is the term in the conclusion. So this con this uh, commits the fallacy of the illicit major. And it's the illicit major because the animals is the major term, okay? So when we come down here, this is going to be an illicit minor because we're going to be talking about the minor term, okay? So we look down here and it says all animals are tigers. This is an A statement and with A statements, the subject is distributed. So that would make the word animals distributed. So then we come up and we look at the two premises and where does the word animals occur? It occurs in the second premise. It says all mammals are animals. Well, right here, we know that the all is an A statement. And with an A statement, the subject is distributed. So it's mammals and mammals, animals. It's not the same term. So this commits the fallacy of illicit minor. And it's an illicit minor because in this one, it's the minor term that's, that should have been distributed. Okay, so illicit major, the, uh, ma the predicate should have been distributed, and illicit minor, the subject should have been dis distributed. So make sure you don't mix those up, because that's a lot of times students mix those up. But if you're talking about the predicate, that's the major term, which would be the major, illicit major. If it's the subject, um, then that's the illicit minor. Okay, and then this is important to note. If no terms are distributed in the conclusion, then rule two cannot be violated. 
So that makes sense. If no terms are distributed in the conclusion, then rule two cannot be violated. So don't make that mistake either. Um, I'm not going to do that to you on the test, but your Applia homework will try to confuse you as much as possible because that's the nature of the homework. But trust me, I've used other homework programs, and Applia is the easiest one out there. And I know y'all struggle with it at times, but it really is the easiest. Okay. So now we get to rule number three. Rule number three, two negative premises are not allowed. Now with rule number three, this we're going to start talking about the quality. That's what we're focusing on, and that gives you another way to help tie it in and understand. If two neg negative premises occur, then the fallacy is called exclusive premises. Okay. So let's look at this example. No fish are mammals. Some dogs are not fish. Okay. So if you remember quality, negative is no or are not. So if we look in this first one, look, they say the word no, which is fine, until we come down to the second premise and it says are not. So you have two negative premises and you cannot have two negative premises because when you have that every time, it's going to cause something to be invalid. Okay, And that commits the fallacy of exclusive premises. And in your textbook, it does give you an explanation of why those rules are the way they are. Some of them are pretty easy for you to see on your own, and I know that others of them are more confusing. Um, but I have found over the years, as I've taught logic and I've tried to explain the reasoning behind it, students have just gotten more confused, generally speaking. So if you're one of those people that want to know why, then look in your text because it gives an explanation of why. Okay, so now rule number four, this is also dealing with quality. A negative premise requires a negative conclusion. And a negative conclusion requires a negative premise. Okay, and that obviously, I think this is an easy one to see, because if you're having a negative in one part, you're going to have to have a negative in the other part. It just won't make sense. Okay, the fallacy committed you can be one of two. You can either be drawing an affirmative conclusion from a negative premise, or you can draw a negative conclusion from affirmative premises. Okay, so let's look at this first example. Okay, all cows are birds. Now I put a plus sign by that because that's a positive statement, an affirmative statement, because it says all are. Now the next premise, some wolves are not crows. I put a little uh, negative sign by that because this is a negative statement because of the are not. So when we get down to the conclusion, it says some wolves are birds. And that's a positive statement. However, since we have a negative statement up here, there's no way that you can have a positive conclusion. So this is drawing, this is the first fallacy up here, this is drawing an affirmative conclusion from a negative premise. And you can't do that. But I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. Now let's go to the next one. Okay. It says all triangles are three angled polygons. Okay, that is a positive, that's an affirmative uh, statement. I have a plus sign by it, by it because it says all are. We go down to the next one. It says all three angled polygons are three sided polygons. Again, this is an affirmative statement because of the all are. Now we come down to the conclusion. It says some three sided polygons are not triangles. Because of the are not, this is a negative statement. And when you have two positives, you can't draw a negative conclusion from things that are only positive. Okay. And then the last rule, according to Bullion, and I can't remember if I said that. These first five rules are according to Bullion. I don't know if I wrote that down. But just so you know, the first five rules are according to Bullion. So with these first five rules, if it's valid according to the first five, it's, uh, it's going to be valid according to Aristotle. Okay. If it's um, invalid, uh, then you have to test it by Aristotle, but we'll get to that in a second. So rule number five, if both premises are universal, the conclusion cannot be particular, okay. which that hopefully makes sense because if you have two universal things, you can't go from universal to particular. The fallacy committed is existential fallacy, and this is from the Boolean standpoint only because this does not apply necessarily with Aristotle. So it, from the 
Boolean standpoint is an extensional fallacy. So let's give you an example. So we have all mammals are animals, all tigers are mammals. Both of those are universal statements because remember all and no make universal statements. But the conclusion, it says some tigers are animals. Well, that's a particular statement. If you have two universal premises, you cannot have a, a particular conclusion according to the Boolean point of view. Okay, and the reason why is because Boolean does not Im imply existence. Okay, now with these first five, uh, with all these five rules, just make you aware that a categorical syllogism may, um, it may commit one or more, it may break one or more of the rules. And that is normal, okay? So you can have a categorical syllogism that, that breaks two of the rules, and that's fine. I'm not going to do that to you on the test. But in your Applia homework, just be aware that it may break more than one rule, and he will do that to you frequently, Hurley, the person who wrote it, because I like Hurley, but he, in some instances, made this way harder than it needed to be for people just starting out. Okay, so now Aristotle's standpoint. So if any categorical syllogism that breaks one of the first four rules is invalid by Aristotle, okay? However, if only rule five is broken, it is valid by Aristotle on the condition that the critical term denotes at least one existing thing. And remember that table in the previous section in, in chapter five, the table of uh, conditionally valid syllogistic forms? Remember, it had figure one, figure two, figure three, figure four, but then it had required condition, that's what that's talking about. So you've got to look at what term is critical, okay? Because it could be the subject, the predicate, or the middle term. So in our last example, and let me pull this example back up, okay? This was invalid according to Boolean because you have two universal premises and then you have a particular conclusion. However, since this is the only rule that is broken in this syllogism, we need to test it by Aristotle since Aristotle implies that things actually exist. Okay, so now we have to look and determine what the critical term is with this. Okay, so then you have to look at your chart, unless you have it memorized, look at your chart and figure out the mood and the figure and then look and see what the critical term is. And in this example, the critical term is tigers. The critical term is tigers. Okay, so since no other rules are broken, only rule number five, and the critical term is tigers, um, this one is valid by Aristotle because the required condition is that tigers exist, and we do know that tigers actually exist. Now, for some reason it said unicorns, okay, then it would be invalid by Aristotle. So, once again, I just want to encourage you, if you're having problems understanding these things, please watch the videos over and over again. Um, I met with one of my students, and I'm not going to give her name, but she knows who she is. Uh, but I met with one of my students yesterday who's uh, in the logic class online, and she said that she was you know, struggling still, so she came to see me, and we worked through some issues. And I started thinking about, after she left, that one of the problems is, since you don't have me in a live class, you can't hear me repeat things a million times, which is what I do. I have done that some here, particularly with the all, no, some, and are. Some of the small things I, I can, but due to the time limits of YouTube videos, I can't repeat myself over and over again with everything. So if there's something you don't get, don't give up or don't think you're stupid. It has nothing to do with being stupid. Logic, for the most part, is a difficult subject. Take the time to watch these videos again. If you need to watch them several times, please do so because that's how you're going to get the most from these videos. And then after that, if you're still confused, please call me. We can talk over the phone if you can't come in or we can set up a time to meet. So that is all and I will see you for section 5.4.